Green hydrogen, once dismissed as too costly and too complex, is entering a new phase where economics and engineering finally align. For years, analysts circled a single number as the industry's tipping point, $2 per kilogram. At around that price, green hydrogen starts to compete with fossil-based gray hydrogen on merit, not just on morals. A few years ago, that sounded aspirational. Electrolytic hydrogen typically clocked in anywhere between $4 and $12 per kilogram, while gray hydrogen from natural gas sat comfortably around $1 to $3. But the chessboard has changed. Rapid advances in electrolyzer design, mass production at gigawatt scales, smarter system integration, cheap renewable power, and forceful policy tailwinds have shifted the curve. In the sunniest, windiest, best-sided projects, we're brushing that $2 landmark now, sometimes effectively below it once incentives are counted. And the meaning is profound. Heavy industry, long-haul mobility, seasonal power storage, and ammonia for fertilizers can all decarbonize faster because the fuel that unlocks them is becoming affordable. Why does $2 matter so much? Because it's where green hydrogen stops needing special pleading. Steel mills that currently rely on coke can eye direct reduction using hydrogen without shattering their balance sheets. Refineries that need high purity hydrogen for desulfurization can swap in green molecules without imposing a crippling cost penalty on end consumers. Ammonia plants, which feed the world's agriculture, can start replacing natural gas-derived hydrogen with renewable H2 and keep the cost of fertilizer within reach. Trucking fleets that operate on thin margins can consider hydrogen fuel cell drivetrains, where duty cycles and refueling speed trump battery weight and downtime. And grid operators wrestling with renewable curtailment can store surplus electricity in chemical form and dispatch it later without paying a premium. This is the rationale behind the U.S. Department of Energy's hydrogen shot targets. $2 per kilogram on the way to one by 2030. Set a clear price signal, align public and private capital, and let industrial ingenuity do the rest. At the heart of this shift is the electrolyzer, the machine that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen using electricity. For decades, alkaline electrolyzers did the heavy lifting for industrial hydrogen, and they still shine where steady-state operation and low capex dominate. But modern alkaline stacks look nothing like their ancestors. They benefit from thinner diaphragms and optimized electrodes that reduce resistive losses, better flow channels for bubble removal, and modular frames that simplify scaling from megawatts to gigawatts. Then came PIEM, proton exchange membrane electrolyzers, which thrive in dynamic environments. Pair them with solar and wind, and they can ramp quickly, sip electrons when they're cheapest, and produce high-purity hydrogen without complex downstream cleanup. PEM stacks have marched up the learning curve, Membrane chemistry improved, iridium loadings dropped via clever coatings and dispersion, titanium components became thinner and more durable. The result is more hydrogen per square centimeter, lower capital cost per kilowatt, and longer service life. Newer architectures add fresh momentum. AEM, a nion exchange membrane, electrolyzers borrow SEM's solid polymer construction while using alkaline chemistry that can work with non-precious catalysts. If they continue to scale successfully, AEM systems could combine the best traits of both worlds. Flexible operation, simpler balance of plant, and materially cheaper stacks. High temperature solid oxide electrolyzers, SOECs, approach the efficiency problem from another angle. If you can feed them hot steam, say from an industrial process or nuclear plant, they need less electrical work per kilogram of hydrogen. Demonstrations have shown electricity consumption in the high 30s, kilowatt hours per kilogram, under optimal conditions, compared to the Chiener's 50 kilowatts electricity ballpark for low temperature systems. That's a dramatic cut in operating cost when power prices dominate your bill. Of course, efficiency is only half the equation. The other half is scale. A learning curve is unforgiving in a good way. Double cumulative production and cost tend to drop by a predictable percentage. That was the solar story, it was the lithium-ion story, and now it's the electrolyzer story. Global manufacturing capacity for electrolyzers has exploded from boutique volumes to tens of gigawatts per year with factories in Europe, the United States, and Asia racing to out-automate each other. 
China's entrance accelerated the trend, applying its hard-won manufacturing playbook to alkaline systems and pushing turnkey prices down sharply. But the narrative is broader than one geography. European players have retooled for scale with standardized modules, automated stack lines, and vertically integrated supply chains. U.S. firms buoyed by incentives and demand from hydrogen hubs are building capacity close to their core markets. As equipment cost falls, developers can stretch project footprints further, negotiate better EPC terms, and spread fixed infrastructure costs across more output. Scale isn't just factories, it's also projects. Gigawatt-class developments convert design repetition into cost compression. Standardized skid packages, replicated power electronics, copy-paste water treatment trains, and serial construction all shave time and money. In the Middle East, where world-beating solar irradiance meets steady nighttime winds, projects achieve enviable capacity factors by stacking resources that complement each other. In Australia and Chile, abundant land and high renewable potential promise, vast export-oriented hydrogen and ammonia flows. In the United States, seven federally-backed hydrogen hubs are knitting together producers, pipelines, storage, and off-takers in a coordinated way, de-risking the first customer problem that often stalls new infrastructure. Europe's hydrogen bank and regional hydrogen valleys integrate production with refineries, fertilizers, mobility, and even district heating, squeezing extra value out of every kilowatt hour and every byproduct. Which brings us to systems thinking. The cheapest kilogram of hydrogen isn't made by the fanciest stack alone. It's made by a project that uses every asset to its fullest. Co-locating electrolyzers at wind and solar plants captures electrons that would otherwise be curtailed and avoids some transmission fees. Running flexibly to harvest the lowest cost hours drops your average power price while maintaining high annual output. Capturing low-grade heat from low-temperature electrolysis and routing it into district heating or industrial preheating improves overall energy utilization. Using oxygen byproduct in wastewater treatment, glass furnaces, or steelmaking replaces separate oxygen purchases and reduces net cost. Providing grid services, frequency response or synthetic inertia creates ancillary revenue that can tip the economics. Each of these optimizations may save only pennies per kilogram on its own, but deployed together they can move real dollars. Policy has been the great accelerant. The United States Section 45V Production Tax Credit, which rewards low carbon intensity with up to $3 per kilogram, turned spreadsheets upside down overnight. Projects that penciled at $5 to $7 suddenly penciled at two to four on a net basis, unlocking financing and allowing developers to sign off take agreements with confidence. Europe's approach using competitive auctions and carbon contracts for difference narrows the spread between green hydrogen and fossil incumbents while avoiding over-subsidization. Carbon pricing in the EU and Canada ratchets up the cost of emitting, indirectly improving the business case for electrolytic hydrogen especially in refineries, chemicals, and steel. India's green hydrogen mission layers production incentives with domestic electrolyzer manufacturing support, aiming to localize the value chain and reach sub-$2 costs later in the decade. Japan and South Korea, resource-constrained but technology-rich, are underwriting early demand in transport and power, seeding markets that exporters in Australia, the Middle East, and Latin America are racing to serve. And finally, alignment on certification, what exactly counts as green, is maturing, smoothing cross-border trade and investment. Let's ground this in projects. Consider a solar-anchored PEM facility in Spain paired with a fertilizer plant. The electrolyzer runs hardest when the sun is high and wholesale prices plunge, then throttles back when the grid tightens, avoiding expensive hours. The hydrogen feeds ammonia synthesis on site displacing gray hydrogen and the associated CO2. Waste heat preheats process streams. Oxygen offsets purchased oxygen. Result, competitive green ammonia without relying exclusively on policy. Shift to the Gulf Coast of the United States, where cheap wind and solar meet existing hydrogen pipelines, salt dome storage, and refineries thirsty for molecules. 
layer in 45V and hub funding, and net cost near $2 emerge, even before learning curves and larger deployments push the baseline down further. Look east to Inner Mongolia, where massive wind solar bases feed containerized alkaline skids at half gigawatt scale. The combination of low capex and ultra-cheap electrons produces some of the most competitive green hydrogen on the planet. And in the Middle East, projects like Eniom use multi-gigawatt hybrid renewable plants, battery buffers, and standardized electrolysis blocks to crank out hydrogen at costs that would have been unthinkable only a few years ago, converting it to ammonia for easy shipping. Technology choice matters, but context rules. Alkaline makes sense when you want rock-bottom capex and steady operation. PEM shines where flexibility, purity, and fast ramping capture cheap hours and ancillary revenues. AEM offers a potential middle path by slashing precious metal dependence without sacrificing solid polymer simplicity. As those factories scale, we'll learn just how low costs can go. SOEC wins wherever hot steam is abundant. Steel mills, chemical parks, nuclear stations, collapsing electrical consumption and boosting round-trip efficiency if hydrogen is later turned back into power or chemicals. Smart developers pick the right tool for the job, then engineer the surrounding system. Power purchase agreements, water sourcing and polishing, compression and storage, offtake contracts and byproduct utilization to make every component carry its weight. None of this is to say that the path is frictionless. Interconnection queues remain long in many markets. Transmission build-out lags renewable growth. Permitting can be labyrinthine. And supply chains, especially for certain membranes, catalysts, and specialty metals, must keep up with demand. Water sourcing must be handled responsibly, with desalination or reclaimed water where necessary, and with attention to local hydrology. Standards for measuring the true carbon intensity of hydrogen must be clear and consistent to prevent greenwashing and ensure that policy rewards the real deal. Shipping hydrogen as ammonia or liquid organic carriers adds conversion losses and logistics complexity. Markets will need time to converge on the right vectors for each route and sector. And naturally, not every early project will hit its budget or schedule. But the general direction is unmistakable. Each cohort is cheaper and better than the last, and the industry's muscle memory is building fast. Perhaps the most encouraging signal is the convergence of independent trends. Renewable electricity keeps getting cheaper, and in grids with high renewable penetration, it's often cheapest precisely when electrolyzers can use it best. Electrolyzer capex keeps falling as factories learn and as design standardize. Efficiency inches upward through better materials, flow designs, and high temperature options. Projects get larger and more integrated, harvesting synergies that pilots never could. Policies are increasingly designed to taper as costs drop, handing the baton to market forces without an abrupt cliff. And end-use sectors, from green steel to e-fuels, are forming real demand pools that developers can bank against. When multiple S-curves stack, inflection points come faster than linear thinkers expect. So what does the mid to late 2020s actually look like on the ground? Expect a surge of 50 to 300 megawatt projects tied directly to industrial loads, refineries, fertilizers, glass and food processing. Because collocating demand and supply removes a mountain of risk. Expect the first wave of multi-gigawatt export platforms to reach mechanical completion in the Middle East, Australia, and Latin America, shipping ammonia into Asia and Europe while buyers calibrate specs, logistics, and price hedges. Expect hydrogen hubs in the United States to break ground on shared infrastructure, pipelines, storage caverns, multimodal fueling, lowering barriers for second movers. Expect Europe to continue refining its auction designs, pushing strike prices down as developers sharpen their pencils and equipment prices fall. Expect China to keep scaling domestic capacity while exporting competitively priced stacks and balance of plant gear, catalyzing adoption in emerging markets. And expect AEM and SOEC to carve out growing niches as their respective cost and efficiency advantages crystallize in real projects. The economics will increasingly hinge on the electricity deal. Long tenor power purchase agreements at 2 to 3 cents per kilowatt hour in great wind solar belts practically guarantee competitive hydrogen. Flexible strategies, 
Buy at the nodal price floor. Self-generate when it's cheapest. Provide grid services when margins are slim. Will dominate. Battery buffers won't aim to arbitrage entire days. They'll smooth intra-hour ramps, protect stack health, and avoid demand charges. Water handling will be standardized. One skid to take raw or reclaimed water to boiler feed quality, another to polish it for electrolysis, with robust pretreatment to keep membranes happy. Compression, storage, and distribution will be modular too. From 30 bar plant headers to 350, 700 bar fueling, to salt dome cavern storage where geology allows. The best projects won't reinvent these wheels. They'll choose from a catalog. There's also a story here about talent and tools. As green hydrogen moves from concept to commodity, developers and consultants need playbooks that are as rigorous as project finance in solar or wind. Feasibility studies must align techno-economics with siting realities, grid rules, and off-taker credit. Financial models must capture duty cycles, degradation curves, catalyst replacement, stack refurb schedules, and policy credit timelines. Bankability will come from standardization, repeatable contracts, proven vendors, performance guarantees, and clear recourse. This is where professional training and shared resources matter. The faster teams converge on best practices, the faster costs fall and capital flows. If there's a single takeaway, it's that cheaper than ever is not a slogan. It's the compounding outcome of hundreds of design, manufacturing, policy, and market decisions all leaning in the same direction. A handful of percentage point improvements in efficiency, a few hundred dollars per kilowatt shaved off capex, a smarter operating profile that buys power two cents cheaper, a district heating link that monetizes waste heat, an oxygen offtake that offsets purchases, stack these and the $2 milestone appears, first in the best geographies, then in many. And once those reference projects operate reliably, replicate, and publish data, the rest of the market follows with lower cost of capital and tighter contingencies. Green hydrogen is, at last, stepping into the role energy modelers reserved for it, decarbonizing the stubborn sectors that electricity alone can't easily reach. Refineries, fertilizers, steel, long-haul transport, shipping fuels, backup generation, and seasonal storage. Each has a credible pathway now. None of it is automatic and none of it is perfectly smooth, but the contours are visible, the pioneers are building, and the economics are moving from if to how fast. So, as green hydrogen keeps getting cheaper, one thing is clear. The clean energy revolution isn't just coming, it's already here. But the real question is, will you be ready to build the next great hydrogen project? At ReneeEnergy.com, we've created the Green Hydrogen Project Development and Financing course, your step-by-step -step roadmap for turning clean energy ideas into bankable assets. You'll learn how to plan, model, and finance green hydrogen plants using proven tools, case studies, and templates you can deploy immediately. If you want to go beyond the headlines and design a project with realistic assumptions, robust risk management, and investor-ready economics, visit h 2 hub type reneeenergy.com or click the link in the description to get started today. Join the community of professionals shaping the future of energy because the hydrogen economy isn't waiting and neither should you.